So I thought I would start by just giving us a little refresher on the Burnout Society. I think all of us have read Burnout Society, somewhat of an emblematic text for our time. As you know that if you've read some of Capitalism and Death Drive, what, what Han is doing there, at least as I see it, is sort of picking up a lot of threads that are developed in Burnout Society. But Burnout Society, I don't know if it's his magnum opus, um, but as a kind of philosophical essayist, um, his writing is extremely seductive to us. I think we all have a little bit of maybe, I'm speaking for myself, but we have a little jealousy for the sheer capacity, almost like Walter Benjamin style, uh, this kind of aphoristic, essayistic, short, punchy paragraphs, which convey <coughs> an extreme, extreme amount of theoretical insight and depth, right? And originality. So um, let me just, ref as a refresher, if I, if I might, um, would it be helpful if I shared my screen of my notes so you can sort of look and see what I'm, would that be better? Okay, let me, let me do that real quick. Um, I want to be charitable here. Okay, so, all right. Okay, so one of the things that's really funny is I was rereading Burnout Society and it's obviously written pre-COVID and <laughs> he makes this claim that the structure of the sort of post-disciplinary society of our, of our own time is not a bacteriological age, which, which means that um, no longer is our relationship to otherness and to authority and to power structured along what he calls an immunological paradigm, right? But he says that our age is the age of, of, of a virus. So we live in this um, strange illness, which is interior to the system itself, right? So that no longer are the, um, points of assault to the kind of edifice of our system outside, coming from outside, right? Like everything is this kind of strange collapse. And one of the most haunting sections of burnout society was a fairly convincing argument that we basically are in a kind of post Kojevian master slave dialectic, like the master slave dialectic um, is no longer the logic of, of social relations today, right? So we have a kind of um, new theory of mediation based on, um, on, on, on a kind of notion of, vi of, of, of virality, right? And what I find compelling in this uh, uh, proposal, which I also think is highly reliant on Deleuze's very, very important early 1990s essay, um, Postscripts on the Societies of Control, um, or on the Control Societies, which I'll, I have a few notes just as kind of reminders of what Deleuze is talking about in that text. If he references the text in a way which is critical of, of it, and I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit about what he says there, but the big, um, fascinating theme that Han wants to present to us is that difference replaces otherness as the logic of power, authority, sociality, etc. And that um, we have this kind of uh, brought about, which is, he, 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 he doesn't quite address the kind of causal dynamics that bring this about. He sort of says, this is my theory of globalization in a certain sense. Um, but if you actually reread Deleuze's postscript on the societies of control, we often uh, forget actually that this text is, has a very um, Marxian um, impulse, right? Because what uh, pushes the social order out of the disciplinary society for Deleuze is some type of shift within the division of labor, right? And that this shift in the division of labor um, constitutes power 
in a fundamentally different orientation than it than it had been, right? And I feel like there's more that needs to be written about Deleuze's kind of undergirding Marx, Marxological analysis there, even though, as you may have seen this very unfortunate section of the second chapter, where Han discusses his big debate with Negri, or maybe it's the third chapter, um, where he says, Marxism, I'm paraphrasing, he says, Marxism has nothing to teach us about the achievement society, the burnout society, or neoliberalism, because in some sense, neoliberalism is the burnout society, and it is the achievement society. So this achievement society is marked by an excess of the same. Um, it's it, it, it based on a surplus of overproduction, right? And that it produces a different type of social violence than the disciplinary model, right? And one of the things that I do wanna stress here is that Han is not um, obviously uh, foolish enough to invoke some kind of nostalgic um, return to a kind of order of otherness, right? He, at the end of the burnout society, in the last few chapters, he presents what I would consider a type of uh, aesthetic praxis. And I want to actually ad identify a few of those. Having read the latest text, I actually don't see as much, if you like, concrete praxis or concrete ideas on how to deal with some of these new symptoms. So in that sense, maybe this text, maybe I'm wrong, I, maybe I need to reread further, but I'm not sensing as much. But nonetheless, we can, we can um, explore that. Um, so I think you, got, you, you all have a sense of kind of this shift, um, but let me say a few things about Deleuze's control societies just as, as, um, as background. So obviously we have a kind of crisis of sovereignty and the crisis of sovereignty has to do with the kind of incapacity for subjectivity to declare um, its singularity that would come from a certain master-slave conflictual basis, right? So to the extent subjectivity can ascertain its own singularity, we need to think precisely about how to forge some type of rupture based on this new paradigm, um, not based on this old one, right? Some of the things that marked the old paradigm were sort of sort of values of duty, of sacrifice, even of suffering and so on, basically had a kind of tell us, right? And that um, this the injunction if you like the super egoic injunction of the disciplinary society was based on a model of prohibition, right? And Han has a kind of maxim for the achievement society, which is that the can of the self produces the should, right? So that the injunction of the super ego is, even though he doesn't like to cite Lacan, is absolutely, I would say, in line with the kind of Shizeki and Lacanian theory of the interiorization of the superego. Now, of course, when you say that, the funny thing about the Lacanian injunction there is there's a certain relationship to the maternal that's at play there, and that there's a kind of deprivileging or there's a decline of the paternal function in this new superegoic um, apparatus or setup. Han doesn't go that deep into the psychoanalytic structure, um, but I think for Lacan, it's essential to, to sort of, in other words, theorize it vis-a-vis -vis Oedipus, right? Um, and here I make the point um, that the, the shift in the prohibition model to a more flexible model and so on, and here we could invoke the, the, the thesis of Boltanski and Chiapello in the new spirit of capitalism around the kind of 68 thesis where power becomes horizontal, right? As a, as a result of the kind of meeting of the demands of the multitude from the street protests, right? That the sort of, I don't know if you're familiar with that text, but they basically make this claim that business literature adopts the demands, the libertarian demands, um, which 
propelled capitalism into a new orientation of power, right? But I reread Deleuze's Control Societies and he argues, or rather he periodizes this shift, uh, funny enough, actually in a much more Marxian periodization tied into some kind of, even, even something that was happening within Fordism for him, already saw the shift split apart. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you can see some of these notes here. In 20th century, control was about control over the past and the future. Now control is largely about data. And the important point here is that um, the agency of power today is placing the position of the state no longer in the same kind of vein that a lot of historical materialist Marxist arguments place the state. Rather, Deleuze talks about an archipelago of power, right? And that, quote, institutions come before the state in the regulation of the, of the power. Right. Um, so all of this leads to um, the condition, the condition of a sort of diminished um, efficacy of the other. Right. And by efficacy of the other, it also signals a decline in the efficacy of the effects of social conflict. Right. So Han talks a lot about the fact that social conflict is foreclosed today. Right, and that one of the kind of subversive gestures, maybe you could say emancipatory gestures today, would be one that tries to resurrect some new way of the management of conflict. And here I'm thinking as a Marxist very much of like productive ways to do class struggle or productive ways in which a certain sectarianism could actually, because I think the achievement society, he's right, to argue against Negri, although Negri has other problems, but let's take his argument at face value, which is that the achievement society, purely from the standpoint of its forces of power, um, a subject who, who is internalizing this, these forms of positivity and achievement and so on, um, has an extremely difficult time forging the kind of necessary and kind of ultimately healthy forms of sectarianism that would produce the types of solidarity that are that are necessary for 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 social change, right? So I think that the achievement society gives us Marxists a great deal of insight about some of the kind of deadlocks of of things like class struggle. Um, okay, so uh, now praxis. I'm defining praxis here as some form of kind of not exactly a dialectical theory per se, although maybe we could see in what way Han is trying to resurrect some new theory of dialectics that may be at play. But a couple of things he says, one is we need to harness a new theory of boredom, right? And we need to privilege against Hannah Arendt who had this notion of vida activa as the primary modality of human praxis, we need to emphasize vida contemplativa, which is the contemplative life, right? So this is kind of um, sense in which um, he invokes the biopolitical paradigm, relying on Agamben and Foucault and others to, to basically make an argument that um, humans must uh, carve out a new space of uh, tiredness, boredom, and kind of opting out or not to, which we'll get to in a second, which is sort of capable of, I guess you could say seeing, it's this theory of aesthetics as well, seeing this condition in its, in its, um, in its real dimension maybe, right? Um, on tiredness, he has a beautiful point where he says, most uh, exchange that we have on tiredness is egoic, it's I-ness, but there may be a type of emancipatory um, form of tiredness that would be found in a we tiredness, 
a kind of um, a kind of turning of the burnout exhaustion into a sort of different form of solidarity, a different form of relationality, right? And he has all of this stuff on Bartleby politics, which I personally find um, this notion of the two types of potency that you can see here. Um, the second form, the kind of Obama orientation is only, as you know, simply a reaffirmation in a very symmetrical way of precisely the injunction of the achievement society. So we must kind of institute some kind of negative potency, right? And he doesn't really elaborate on that, but I think that there's a lot of very good theory on this from queer theory. And there's a lot of very interesting proposals. Even I'm not as convinced of this old Leninist kind of Zizekian theory of Bartleby politics and Agamben as well. I don't think that their theories have much to teach us here. I'm much more in line with kind of Hans' aesthetic uh, notion. And he, he emphasizes the notion of play, which again, then also discusses the importance of this as well. So those are some kind of reminders of, of burnout society. I don't know if anybody has comments or if there's any portions of burnout society that you wish to raise uh, or kind of even anything about Hans' wider project before we jump into the main text. Okay. Um, I'll just say a few things that strike me about, about this first uh, chapter in Capitalism and Death Drive. So, um, <clears throat> this quote that I've highlighted from um, the text where the burnout society has reached a point whereby the issue of death drive exceeds merely the Freudian biological thesis, which we should note the Lacanian thesis of death drive also intentionally uh, pushes the, um, the logic onto structural linguistics and moves away from biological footing. Han doesn't care about that, in part because I don't think that Han is a philosopher who's interested in the kind of reduction of a theory of Geist or of a, of a theory of, of the social, right? That would be situating language in such a central fashion, right? As we had with the post-structuralists, right? So he's not really a Derridian. He's definitely not a Lacanian, right? Um, some of his references are often to very classical interlocutors of modern theory, right? Uh, Kant, Walter Benjamin, um, lots of Foucault. His favorite French philosopher is obviously Deleuze, right? So it's a very interesting uh, point. But this, this quote here, humankind's self-alienation may have reached a point, quote, where it can experience its own annihilation as a supreme aesthetic pleasure. I don't know about you, but this really reminds me of Jean-Francois Lyotard's libidinal economy, this, what he called his evil book, right? Which was evil in part because he makes this claim that 19th century proletariat or the proletariat in any age, uh, the fundamental problem uh, is that they come to um, find a pleasure in their suffering, right? Which is usually cited by commentators as the most evil thing to say, right? Because once you accept that proposal, you accept a certain fatalistic theory of death drive, right? Like I, I brought these quotes from Leotard here to, to, to show you uh, what I mean by this, um, uh, if you bear with me. Uh, uh, so he says, uh, if I can find it, uh, uh, where did I put it? Uh, yeah, there's no need to do political economy. Be inside and forget it. Right? So in a certain similar sense to Han, this kind of all enveloping achievement society, be inside and forget it. 
that's the position of the death drive. Within the system, the unconscious demand of the masses is, quote, long live the libidinal. It's not long live the social. So even Lyotard had a certain theory of the collapse of the other. Because when we say the social, I think we're also really talking about a certain theory of otherness, a certain theory of relationality, right? And so what Lyotard was basically grappling with, and if you really want to understand the kind of secret of his project, you have to look at him as a kind of left Augustinian, right? He's sort of working with the theory of um, li the living flesh libido theory that comes from this really crazy French thinker called Klosowski, who's actually also a left Nietzschean, one of the most important left Nietzscheans. Um, and his theory was that um, St. Augustine uh, created a collapse of the uh, uh, sign signification system such that um, there was no longer an outside of the human community, in part because you know, he makes this Christian claim that the kingdom uh, of heaven is already sort of with us or already upon us and so on. And in a certain sense, in a pessimistic sense, Lyotard tries to um, work with this hypothesis of an Augustinian fatalism. And he develops this notion, Klosowski does, of the phantasm, right? And you'll notice this notion of the voluptuous emotion. That is precisely what Deleuze and Guattari speak of as one form of a libidinal affect in anti-Oedipus, right? It's exactly from Klosowski's living currency. That's the text, living currency, right? And um, uh, the basic point here is that um, capitalism, and you'll see this at the end of Han's text as well, uh, produces a kind of self-insulated form of currency exchange, which trades in what Lyotard calls, what's most interesting about the form of exchange within capitalism, is he, he calls it there's certain, what he calls tensor moments, right? There are certain forms of affect which occur through capitalist consumption, commodity fetishism, and so on, which become sites of absolute excessive jouissance, right? So everything about capitalism becomes this kind of impossible exchange of these points of excessive jouissance for which there's really no determinant outside of that, right? Anyways, so sorry for that slight uh, detour, but I think it's actually that, that much of what Han is saying here is very much similar to Lyotard's libidinal economy. Um, it's worth looking at nonetheless. Um, I'll say a few more things and then turn it over to, to Ricky. And oh, by the way, our, our uh, policy is anybody jumps in with comments at any time, of course. Okay, so the question that he poses is, is capitalism a logic of death drive, which is homologous to Freud's biological theory of death drive? And in a later part of the chapter, he obviously elaborates what Freud means there. And he notes this guy, Arthur uh, Schnitzler, um, who says that the history of humanity is like the progress of a deadly infectious disease, growth and destruction become one and the same, right? It is then not conceivable that for some higher organism that we're incapable of grasping in its totality and within which humankind finds the condition, necessity and meaning of its own existence, humankind represents an illness that tries to destroy that organism and the further it develops, must destroy it. The same way that a bacterium seeks to annihilate the human individual who has been taken ill. That's a bit of a foreshadow to what Han will say at the end of this chapter where he argues that we should understand death as, you know, death as in the killing of another, as a certain strategy precisely for fending off death of one's own, one's own death. And that that movement is homologous to what Freud discusses as death drive, as the logic of a kind of preservation of the organism, right? 
and this is obviously why we know that Spinoza becomes so thinkable with Freud, right? Because if death drive has to do with this kind of um, almost nirvanic uh, 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 self-preservation of the organism in a state in which the subject says, uh, this organism has a demand, its primary demand is to die its own death, right? There's a certain singularity that comes with that. Um, and there's a certain life, which is only found within death as well, right? It's a bit of a paradox there, right? Um, so, uh, and then of course, uh, it's very interesting that he says this business about civilization and its discontents. Um, I've been putting a lot of thought lately. I don't know if you all have been thinking about this too, but very interesting to me to consider Freud's political agenda as he writes certain seminal texts where he presents his major theories. For example, um, one of the things that Karatani, the Japanese philosopher, uh, pointed my attention to, you may be aware of this, is the fact that Freud, upon the publication of Beyond the Pleasure Principle, 1920, uh, what was the social political context in which Freud was writing? Uh, on the one hand, it was a strange moment where you had the Bolshevik egalitarian uprising, which was successful, right? Like the first true proletarian successful revolution that was sustained. The Paris Commune was successful, but then it was destroyed. But the effects of that Bolshevik revolution within the kind of post Austro Hungarian empire, which Freud was establishing psychoanalysis, created the conditions of a basic socialistic psychoanalysis. So if you ever read a book called Freud's Free Clinics, I forget the author's name, but it's a study of the way that all of the founders of Freud's inner circle uh, received free analysis by the state and that they insisted that every worker receive free analysis. Freud himself insisted this, yeah. Yet, as you also know, uh, the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire also brought with it some profound instability in the social order, which was a precursor to Nazism. And so one of the arguments that Etienne Balibar also makes, similar to Karatani, is that beyond the pleasure principle was a way to sort of preserve the new, sorry, preserve the old in the new. In other words, preserve a kind of old symptomal aristocratic order uh, within this new egalitarian quasi-socialistic. It wasn't fully socialistic because one of the other things is that, are you aware of who was funding all of these free clinics? It's actually American philanthropic corporations like Rockefeller and Ford Foundation and so on, which is a very interesting piece of history. Uh, but nonetheless, like Karatani says that, uh, and I agree with him, that we should read the theory of the death drive as a, as a uh, political and, and the theory of superego as well, both as certain political theories where Freud is trying to take a certain path of moderation, right? So um, anyways, that's an interesting little uh, tangent. Um, I have more notes, but let me actually uh, stop and turn the floor over. We've already gone for about half an hour. Let me pause my reflections and um, uh, introduce Ricky Vargas, who is psychoanalyst in Toronto. And we're very happy to have uh, Ricky join our study group circle. Um, let me share also his notes. Or actually, would you, Ricky, like to share them on the screen, maybe? Um, I'm really technologically unsavvy, so I won't know. How okay, to okay. How to no do. worries, of course. I'm so bad at technology. I'm sure it's really easy, but. Yeah. Oh, I see you linked to the Freud's Free Clinic. Yeah, I just did. Um, it's such an interesting book. I really like it. Um, okay, I'm going to share the, the uh, your comments now. But if anybody wants to jump in with thoughts, Mm -hmm. um, after my, my uh, little ramble there, please feel free.
Okay, I put the word doc there. So, um, so then, you know, um, then Daniel, uh, hi everyone. Hi. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from Toronto, uh, Canada. Um, so then Daniel uh, invited me to, to participate. Um, part of the reason why I kind of said yes is because I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in sort of the kind of concept of the debt drive and sort of interested in sort of how it kind of comes up in different aspects of my own work. Um, and so I'm going to talk a bit about that in my kind of remarks which uh, Daniel shared on Zoom. If you can open the file, you can kind of follow along with me, and uh, that will probably allow you to kind of put into some of my own sort of thought process as I was reading hands, but but Han is kind of an interesting scholar for me that is, I mean, I, I, I only kind of been exposed to him in the last year, year and a half, um, as part of my kind of informing about his work and I've been kind of reading it and bits and pieces here and there. And I'm particularly fascinated by the import of his work in this kind of particular kind of historical and social moment as we kind of collectively and individually um, like to survive the pandemic or you know, what, what that means for each of us, depending on where we are um, kind of located and what communities that we're a part of. So I'm going to just read my remarks and Hopefully, we can have a discussion about some of the things that I brought up or some of the things that Daniel has actually already brought up. Um, so, I want to preface my remarks here by locating myself in the specific context from which I arrive at reading this work by Bill Hilton. I'm a practicing site. Elvis based in Toronto and handed it in the very final stages of his training to become a psychoanalyst at the Toronto Institute of Psychoanalysis, um, which is a classical floor in the Institute affiliated with the International Psychoanalytic Association. I'm also an analyst of postdoctoral fellow in gender, disability, and social justice at Ryerson University here in Toronto. My interest in the debt line as a philosophical talent is a conceptual frame emerged precisely at the nexus of meeting point of three of my friends fields of disciplinary training, Freudian and post in psychoanalysis, clear theory, I love the Bosani, Indian, and the Edelman, and that and ruin studies vis-a-vis the work of Walter Benjamin and Rebecca Tremaine. So as Daniel mentioned, I'm really interested in how clear theory applies here in the enhanced work. So maybe that's something to talk about. Um, that in the general sense and the deadline was specific Conclude has sit quite heavily in my work for, for some time now. My doctoral dissertation led me to explore the intersection of modern and melancholia in the work of Floyd and Benjamin through the specific architectural features of the ruin. Post dissertation, I became interested in ruins within all the a different kinds. The ruin of the body of the body as ruin, precisely in, in, in the history, memory, and aesthetic articulations and output of the AIDS crisis. Put simply, I've written about a genre of art immediately referred to as AIDS art. Presently, as part of my post postdoctoral fellowship, I'm working on two similarly distinct but related projects. The first is a book length study of the relationship and interplay between suicidality as a manifestation of the deadline, forms of labor or work, and sexual difference 
and this one, I'll be exploring how lightness and solace that felt lot in love with the love, I could say that had himself and even abandoned. And some may have said, my ability is to the that line is kind of look, psychic look in two, it's in two dust in the connected historical and two on the year. The second project has been the early AIDS crisis as a historical and important event in the history of sex and sexuality and situated up against the ongoing debates with our normative and clear sexual practices and wild confusion as we see it playing out in the present pandemic. I outlet this background as a way to provide some biographical context for my thoughts here. I believe the importance of in doing so as a way to include how I personally wanted to read Hans' work. The thoughts of that life from a clinical standpoint, I recall in the very, very early days of my early institute in psychoanalysis, an early analyst, after they had just closely read through its thoughts for the times and while in it and beyond the present principle, their thought first makes allusions to the line. Remark, in the clinical setting, I don't find the deadline a useful framework. It doesn't pass muster. It isn't helpful for our patients. I found this statement is curious and a bit horrifying. I found it curious because it felt that an outright dismissal of perhaps one of Freud's, at least in my estimation, most salient preoccupations, namely that. And I found it horrifying that as clear theorists like Douglas Clint, the Edelman, and Ian e. e. had taught me that as clears who survived the AIDS crisis, we all are then survival of having been spared as such in a manner of speaking to our intimate knowledge of and the death. In his now canonical 1987 essay, How to Have Promiscuity in an Epidemic, Douglas Clinton had this to say without an unnecessary intimacy between life and death. Lines that feel eerily resonant in Han's own conception of what it means to think that alongside life, and how only a form of life that returns that life will liberate us from the paradox of undead life. I would promise you, so this is what Clint has to say. Our promiscuity about this is not only about the pleasures of sex, but also the great multiplicity of our pleasures. It is that psychic preparation, that experimentation, that conscious work on our sexualities that has allowed the many of us to change our sexual behaviors. They uh, insist that our promiscuity will destroy us, when in fact it is our promiscuity that will save us. So Clint was talking about some of the early responses to the AIDS crisis. For much of the remaining four years of my learning, many more clinicians seem to hold this opinion. That the threat line or an explanation by an, or an exploration by an analyst of an analyzer's debt lists or impulses were clinically warranted or proven. Much of the elderly world, like, other, like any other industry that deals in the business of recuperation and healing, fetishizes health and well-being. This is so evident in such all too popular elderly modalities, such as cognitive behavioral therapy. Psychoanalysis, that which started off as a field of study and practice concerning all the ambivalences and pitfalls of being human, one that may have brought us close to a sense of an awareness of our own mortality and our own subjectivities as always already being in relation to that, had to keep up with this obsession with health, the promise of a pure, and the positivism and scientism that is obsessed with staining off any confrontation with that. Freud perhaps knew this already as he was born in this new field now over a century ago. 
that its value, its use value, is in a sense of value that the question of what significantly the inventors had he fixated and reflected on that and its potency in relation to life, especially in the context. I want to add in my open remarks that a few publications that have arisen from my own written of Han's work. Um, the is a son of these or none of these. But I wanted to blend these out as a way to open up the discussion a bit more, as a way perhaps to start things off. So speaking of that, Henry is certain a difference of the distinction between the that of the self and the that of the and other. Hans speaks of healing, but I wonder if we may be able to think more closely about the distinction between healing and that itself, and how these can be related to political and accumulation in the context of capitalism. I'm reminded of a recent seminar I participated in, led by Catherine Malibu, on the place of negativity in Freud and the common conceptions of the conscious. In that seminar, Malibu made a distinction between destruction, as in that, and disappearance in the unconscious. She suggested that nothing disappears in the unconscious, nothing is forgotten but that there is no conception of that or our own that. That in the unconscious is always the that of the other. Our own that, if you're able to conceive of it, is experienced as a separation from ourselves. Does this not sit well with Hans' own view that Freud's idea of the dead life ultimately represents an unconscious strategy for repressing the fact of that? To build on this distinction, so number two, to build on this distinction between the death of the self and the death of the other in the context of capitalism, how do we think of the death line as it has played out during the current pandemic? Is it a generalized, is it a generalized fatal of the anti-master or anti-rapture motivated by a death line, an obsession with the death of the other? which in its own turn uh, is motivated by the accumulation of capital. It's this duty reductive, how does the death of oneself fit into the schema? Number three, if capitalism is motivated by accumulation of power and capital and by an obsession with saving off that, both of these by any means necessary, then what is the status of loss in ontological universe. Does the death line as a conceptual tool allow us to account for loss, loss of life, loss of the self, loss of others, loss of love objects? Han, following Baudrillard, suggests that the theory of the suicide bomber is a feature or a symptom of capitalism a part and part of the puzzle of capitalism's brand narrative. He describes the suicide bomber's act alongside the act of one posting a selfie of himself. He reduces the act of it to being a denial gesture, remaking a bomber in the image of the contemporary figure of the influencer. Her, himself, the future a symptom of capitalism. Is this not exemplary of an Olympian vision of violence or evil? Now, violence or evil, the precise violence or evil of capitalism as such, is anything but exceptional. Rather, whatever we mean by evil here is, at its core, profoundly banal, quotidian, or ordinary. And finally, if narcissistic violence, a killing of the other, is a feature of and not a part of the system slash mechanisms of capitalism. What does it mean to return that to life? That we do not stay that off from our own subjective lives, but are clearly aware of it. Is there an ethics to this? 
what it, what it might mean to enjoy that as a feature or symptom of life, and that not about the event that needs to be eradicated or replicated. One might argue that a violent invasion of the rights that we are experiencing presently makes this all the more important to consider. So that's, those are some of the initial thoughts that I have. I'm sure lots of you have very, very different perspectives, and I'm really interested to kind of start this conversation off and see where we all land individually and all collectively. So. That was excellent. Thank you, Ricky, for the presentation I read along very thoughtful. I was struck by the fact that as an analyst, you say that you don't see the death drive in the clinic. I wonder if other, I know we have a few people that practice psychoanalysis on this call. Um, I wonder if others agree with that. That's an interesting observation. Does that, does that mean that the utility or the kind of uh, value of psychoanalysis is a way to theorize the social then more so than the clinical relation? I actually want to, so I want to add, it's not that I don't see the death drive in the clinic. I actually see the death drive every day in my clinic. <laughs> I mean, that's all, that's all that comes up often, but almost all of my patients. I think the institutional psychoanalysis or the institutional classical psychoanalysis right now has a kind of obsession right everywhere in the health field. Um, with respect to the idea of like a cure. You know, we are here to fix people or we are here to like make life livable, not make life confront its own mortality. So I just want to clarify that. It's helpful. Yeah. Great. I'm sure some of you may be uh, burning to to jump in. Now's the now's the time, please. Share your thoughts. I had a, a question which I think gets to also um, some of the, the points of one and three, which Ricky raises um, in the first essay by Han, which which is I, I'm not sure what what he means when he. Um, so this is around page five or so when he's, he kind of adjusts the death drive and says that capitalism is instead afraid of death. And it is at that point where I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what death is for, for, for either for Han or for capitalism. Um, if, if we're saying, which Daniel was saying, that there is no outside of this thing, that's, it's all kind of coming from the inside, but also death is understood either as something, a death of the other or versus a kind of a fear of castration of a, an exterior thing terrorizing you, then, then what is the death that capitalism is running from? And then ironically, later on, then reproducing. Um, so that's not clear to me. Like, is it is it um, the, the death of capitalism as a system? So is it communism or is it the death of the people inside the, the, the economic formation? Um, so that was probably the, the key thing. What was what kind of takes the place of death for capitalism? Uh, which which is then responds to. I you know, I I wondered about that also. And I think that's part of what I was trying to raise is kind of early on in, the, in that first chapter, I wasn't so fully aware of who's that or who who's that time was referring to. Let me, and that's sort of why I wanted it to make this distinction. Are we talking about the death of the self? Because, yeah, I mean, the fixation on health, the fixation on wellness, the fixation on beauty, and you, it's really about preservation of the self. Mm -hmm. um, but then capitalism also depends upon others being sacrificed. You know, I can sit at home safely in the confines of my home, be part of a study group while someone else is out there working on my behalf, you know, making sure that society runs, you know, and so I, 
how it, 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 it's, it's important, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, it sounds it, it, it's not even not even about how, for me, it, it, I feel. Yeah. I invite others to jump in on uh, um, Omid's uh, nice observation there. I have some thoughts, but I wonder what others think when you encounter that in Han's text. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, maybe another way to say it is that like, there's a certain speculative relationality that the human being has to death, which capitalism doesn't need, right? There's, there's a certain, um, there's a certain, the only way of the realization of eros is through death, right? Which is why death drive ultimately becomes the primary um, logic of all the drives. But almost capitalism doesn't doesn't have uh, the same dialectic. Like in the debate that, that Freud says between he and Jung, he remains dualist, or Jung remains monistic. Seems almost capitalist monistic there. It only knows death without uh, some yeah then, then then the question i think you're right is sort of what what then is the countervailing force because there is a countervailing force and that countervailing force is something around the contestation of of, of um of accumulation and surplus and so on right uh but but as we know in the second third chapter han is not um, interested in towing the marxist line which would present a very clear form of negation to capital within proletariat such that even Hart de Negri would say that you can't really understand things like gig economy without the multitude, like the multitude produced the gig economy. And Han says, yes, the gig economy is communism. <laughs> and it's a proof that uh, capitalism will always defeat communistic forms. It's a, that's a whole other thing. But I really don't like that part of Han, by the way. <laughs> um, but what do you what do you folks think about this notion of um, capitalism's own way of negating of negation of death? He says capitalism rests on a negation of death. Capital is accumulated as a defense against death, against absolute loss. Death is what accounts for the compulsion of production and growth. Um, then he says, even Freud does not address death as such because the death drive for Freud is a wish. It's founded in a wish. And then it splits off into sadism, masochism, and there's a debate about the primary status of the two. But it's much more dialectical for Freud. I read this as a certain anti-dialectics of death. I found it something that I never read or I didn't notice before about Hans' work is uh, his Bataille influence. Uh, when he writes here, eroticism is an adventure of continuity. It breaks with the discontinuity of the isolated individual, the basis of the economy. Eroticism gives the self its dead. There is a losing oneself in the other that puts an end to narcissism. So I, I, I think this is almost the opposite for, for Freud and Lacan. Right, I, I think especially for Lacan, the trade drive is, is the opposite. It's this continuity, right, of the one, right, that, that holds this. Uh, the continuity is so, and also it does kind of relates to the second chapter, when he talks about how the revolution is impossible when you have uh, uh, fracture uh, individuals that are depressed. It almost comes to this idea that uh, capitalism is uh, this continuity of isolated individuals, right? So it's, I think it's opposite to what Lacan will think, right? I don't know. Say more, say more about what you, your reading of Lacan there as a kind of contrast, that's interesting. What do you, what do you mean there? Uh, because if I'm right, um, the drive is what uh, make, makes a whole and what makes uh, the continuity or what is possible fail, right? So in, for example, another example, in the second chapter, he says, we are all masters and slaves, right? Yeah. Yeah. But for, for Lacan, there is always deception, right? And this is what the critique of, of Hans, right? 
are we all master and slave? Are we all the entrepreneur? Or there are actually uh, the, these are split in society, the working class, mm. right? So this is this what he fails this neoliberal ideology, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And even Ricky and I were talking before we met for this session how there's a certain um, I dare I dare to use the word Eurocentrism, but there's some strange kind of inverted universalism in Han's definition of the ubiquity of neoliberalism and its force field, that it affects all subjectivity the same. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think he, he means that because he also talks about subjects of, of the migrant, of the immigrant, right? So there are kind of, but ultimately the figure of the migrant is still ultimately subservient to the hegemony of the system, right? Um, they become a kind of aesthetic figure that gives us a kind of line of flight from it, maybe, but ultimately they're captured, right? Everyone is captured, right? Um, that's a sort of different proposal than what we read a lot of, like, I don't know, like some racial capitalist theories and post-colonial theories that like the distribution of the, of the oppression lands differently. Han doesn't really speak about that, those differences, right? Um, I don't know if anyone else sees that, but I see perhaps even Han's uh, fa fame also is afforded by the fact that he's speaking from this kind of, yeah, like European universal standpoint, which is, is, is fine. I'm not saying this is uh, necessarily problematic, but maybe it is problematic in some way, I don't know. I totally agree with you, by the way, even though Lacan may have abandoned his Kojevian Hegelian commitments, Louise, I think you're right that there is, well, maybe with some exception in the late Lacan, that's a whole other debate though, that he remains very dialectical in that way. Um, anyways. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to really hear you. There was a problem with the connection at the beginning. Uh, could you summarize on my, on my side? side? See, on, on, yes, on your side. Oh, shoot. Did ever, nobody could hear me a moment ago? I could hear you. You could? You could? Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry, Luis. Uh, must have been on your side, my friend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. just kidding. <laughs> um, Luis and I have done some serious sessions together in this uh, pandemic period. But I, I agree with you. Like, there's a Bataille undercurrent and there's a leotard undercurrent and there is a kind of pessimistic undercurrent as well um i mean i don't know this is not the only way to treat death drive like right? like look at katarine malibu's treatment of death drive and plasticity right where she sort of inverts the whole dynamic or even look at ernst bloch in the um principle of hope, where if he were to read some of these formulations of death drive, he would, in a classic kind of Marxian orientation, sort of argue that it reeks of a certain bourgeois pessimism as well, right? So I don't know, like, but nonetheless, I'm still seducted by Han's proposal. I mean, I still think that there's something very valid in this framework, but I wonder if others, what other people think about this. I mean, I, I do agree. I just want to, no to notice that uh, it is different from well, like an overall my reading of mechanics. Oh, definitely. Oh, so, definitely. And maybe, maybe it's right, maybe it's not, I don't know. No, definitely. Um, so I don't know, Omid, if we addressed your questions fully or well, or but we tried to throw them out there. I thought that was excellent provocation as well. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, that's um, that's great for me. Uh, I'm it's, in, it's it's incredible the way that he concludes also with this commentary on our archaic economy of violence, and also obviously it connects to Bataille. It's interesting. I know he's not footnoted, but that very much interests me. That's also why I was thinking that this text is so close to Klosowski's living currency as well. Um, so. Uh, 
it's 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 heavy duty stuff in the sense that yeah the the homology between the suicide bomber and the selfie taker is like a certain key to his argument right apropos uh these two logics of death that he's discussing in a certain way very uh very powerful stuff um, Um, can, can I ask, like, what is what is his relationship to to Lacan? He has no relationship to Lacan, as far as I know. Uh, he uh, has never cited Lacan, to my knowledge. Maybe I mean, Ed Jew wrote the introduction of his book on Eros. Right? And Bedju is obviously a classical Lacanian, in my opinion. So certainly aware of Lacan and so on. But I think like a lot of people, Lacan is of another time and he's sort of, um, like there's a certain way that a theoretician can kind of choose to skip over the Lacanian moment in thought. But that doesn't it's mean that it's- a it's it's just such a crazy. I mean, I you know, I'm 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 trying very hard not to. Um, and you know, it's very it's very edifying hearing hearing ever people you know unfold this the argument so generously. You know, it's like it's a good it, it's modeling for me and getting me back in an open more open frame of mind. But I'm kind of like, wait a second, he's not like dealing with it. He's not wrestling with it. He's not like True. True. because it's it's also just right there. I mean the 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 paradox of you know which which is implicit in freud but never really freud can't deal i mean at least by civilization and its discontents right freud is has to ascribe life and life force and life energy you know to aggression on the one hand and to to eros and to basically you know a pact between them or to eros as you know as as the ultimate you know um opponent in a sort of Manichaean, you know, battle of all against all. But but in Lacan, right, is where where one understands one one really gets an account of of drive as a kind of and I mean he talks about you know undead energy and zombies you know right off the bat, um Han does. But um but the notion that there's an energy and a kind of living energy or I mean, I don't know what else to call it, you know, that um, that is that drive ascribes, you know, or insists on or introduces into life, you know, it's maybe the only energy. And of course, the idea, the paradox, right, is it's an end, it's a form of endless labor because it's failed, because it fails, because if it succeeded, <laughs> death would be, would be, uh, you know, the condition. Um, but it's it's only in a living being that one sees this kind of labor and this kind of laboriousness, and uh, you know, and once and one sees as a kind of pouring off of this kind of labor, um, you know, a kind of vitality or or energy that is you know that is frightening, that is uncanny, that is undead. Um, so I just it's just um, it's very strange, and you know, I suppose if I wanted to be um, if I wanted to put a good spin on it, it's it's like it's it's bracing, especially as an academic, you know, who's lashed all the time and and probably unfortunately lashes my students with like you need to engage the material, you need to engage the sources. That he's just like blanket repression, blanket <laughs> repression of this of this whole uh, uh, mode. So I yeah I'm I guess as I as I continue because I'm I'm definitely I mean the ultimately for me, originality of thought and like courage of following one's path of, you know, however, however eccentric is, is the most exciting thing. And he's, this clearly has it in spade. So I'm, I'm going to read it through to the end, but I'm having a hard time, I guess, because of an Lacanian sort of account of, of death, yeah. drive, you know, yeah. which, which ultimately is what made the concept make sense to me. When, when in Freud, I saw, you know, I saw 
um, yeah, I saw a kind of pessimism that seemed preemptive and it seemed in many ways yeah. bourgeois. I mean, as amazing as, amazing as, as yeah. that work is in those two texts and the civilization and then beyond, you know? Right, I, I agree. I mean, I think a lot of uh, what he's relying on is Freudian and post-Freudian analyses of things like certain central categories of sadism, masochism, and their relation of, of narcissism. And I think he's really giving us a picture, which is in some ways very, very similar to Christopher Lash's uh, argument around the culture of narcissism. You know, that argument, which is that um, subjectivity in hypercapitalism, late capitalism, financial capitalism, whatever you wish to call it, experiences a kind of deprivation of the dialectical movement from primary to secondary narcissism. There's a stunting that takes place there. And so that um, uh, there's a certain um, stunted capacity of object cathexis, right? And that um, um, the field of the other also Lash argues similar to Han in burnout society. And in this is a diminished field of otherness for Lash, as we know, he has a certain neoconservative desire for the resurrection of the old paternal order so that the field of otherness is kind of refortified with a certain efficacy, right? So Han does not go that approach, but he's certainly in his analysis. But that analysis, I think, is also um, not a Lacanian analysis because a Lacanian analysis does not privilege um, all of these distinctions between um, ideal ego and ego ideal. They're given a different terrain of application. And I think that um, part of the culture of narcissism is precisely the collapse of um, ego ideals, that ego ideals are commodified, that they're, they're um, no longer embodied in kind of efficacious edible figures for Lash, and that's a problem. And that problem creates a kind of collapse of object libido within, and you have this kind of, um, I don't know, kind of like pure reification of libido, if you like, right? So they have a similar line of analysis, but um, I really think one of the beauty, beautiful things of Lacan's critique of, of that form of thinking, for, of that form of Freudian thinking, is that he's um, making a certain argument against Lash, in a way that the um, affirmation of stable, quote unquote, ego ideals actually is also a source of a certain social or subjective violence, right? Um, that this is actually not the way of subjective, or that this is not the way of the treatment of neurosis, right? Um, so yeah, you're right. There's so much of the the Lacanian orientation should be brought into discussion that would actually help Han because Han doesn't want to reaffirm the, the decline of the paternal function like Lash or other people do, right? Even Freud wishes to do that, right? Like the whole apparatus of Freud is hinged on that efficacy, right? Um, so he wants to take a different direction, um, but he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't have the same psychoanalytic tools. So yeah. Um, I have. I want to return to one point of uh, Ricky's questions. Although, uh, what do others think? If there's any other interventions, please. No, I. I just want to add that I, there's a part of me that almost wishes that it was more of a conversation about narcissism as it relates to capitalism. Um, he, he makes his illusions um, you know, talks about how the suicide bomber is a narcissist with an, an explosive belt, talks about the selfie and the proliferation of the selfie or people who ate selfies and stuff like that. I just, there's a part of it that almost wishes that he dealt more explicitly that kind of the narcissistic elements of capitalism, but also the narcissistic elements of the deadline. Um, and he, 
and then he like in the in the, in the, in the house is uh, and looking for it and reading it. But I in the first chapter I I I miss that he he kind of came out with it and was just really out a bit more about it. Um and I'm mm -hmm. not so so evident to some extent. Um and, yeah. Was that uh, 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 and, and the more, more, more nuanced aspects of narcissism would also allow us as a leader, so me as a leader, to kind of discern between the debt of myself and the debt of others. Um, and yeah, on that, on that point, he makes a nice argument in a later chapter where he does talk about narcissism. And I'll just read this quote. Today, libidinal energy is predominantly invested in the ego. The narcissistic accumulation of ego libido leads to a decrease, decrease in object libido. That is libido that is capable of affecting or investing in objects, okay? Object libido creates an object attachment that in turn stabilizes the ego. Without any object attachment, the ego is left to its own devices, a situation that creates negative feelings such as anxiety or emptiness. And then he says, today, in order to escape this emptiness, one reaches either for the razor blade or the smartphone. There's something, there's something very much like Camus about this guy too, I feel. Like there's something kind of, um, even in his fame as a theoretician, and kind of some of these, you know, these pessimist threads that he develops. It's very similar to a certain, I don't know, a certain fatalism that reminds me of the absurdist uh, uh, position. Uh, but I think the argument is fairly helpful, right? Apropos narcissism and the distinction between ego libido and object libido. I hope everybody is clear on that. This also reminds us of Lacan's thesis in seminar 17 that the, 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 the late capitalist investment in technological devices, not smartphones for him, but we could say smartphones. Um, uh, yeah, he had, he had the insight that they, that they will uh, foretell the diminishment in the efficacy of a certain libidinal cathexis and a certain stabilized point of otherness. Um, it's very interesting to me that like in Han's theory of the diminishment of the other, in a certain sense, if you think about it in contemporary theory and many of you are grad students and teachers, isn't it interesting that like all of the early 2000s interest that we had in like the return to Levinas or the return to theology all of this interest in the in the figure of the other and otherness. Do you see a decrease in that in critical humanities today? I, I do. I see a certain, it's kind of similar to Hans' argument. Within the academic space, I don't know if you all agree. So there's certainly something to this thesis, right? Um, I want to return to Ricky's final question, which is on narcissistic violence, is there an ethics to this, to what it might mean to enjoy death as a feature or symptom of life and not a bug within it that needs to be eradicated or extricated? One might argue that a viral contagion of the likes that we are experiencing presently makes this all the more important to consider. So like, what do you mean exactly by an ethics here? I'm very compelled by this notion. Can you elaborate? It, yeah, yeah, you're on mute. I suppose, you know, I, I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, what, so my, you know, my, my kind of research background is that I, and as I mentioned uh, in, in, my, in my remarks, I, I write a lot about, 
sex and HIV. That's sort of where I like what I do. Um, and I specifically write about, uh, I have written extensively about uh, the sexual practice of their back end or the se sex upon, the, the practice of sex upon them, especially amongst the queer identified uh, men or men who have sex with men. And you know, there's so much, there's so much in harm that I feel that I've already kind of seen in a lot of people like uh, Edelman and Indeen and Dosani. Um, it's kind of clear negativity that is, uh, it, it's just a negativity that is often a part of clear theory around how we embrace forms of that or embrace ideas around that as a way to sustain life or, or as a way to think of life as always already in uh, some kind of dialectical relationship to that. Um, and the AIDS crisis made this a very real end for a lot of queer men. And, you know, it, it choice to have sex with our partners, especially in a generation of men that came after the AIDS crisis. And one, you know, the AIDS crisis is not over, it isn't. But, that kind of active choice to bear back or have sex after, you know, the losses of the AIDS crisis was an embrace of that, or an embracing of that line as a way to choose life. You know, the the mm -hmm. choosing the fuck for that of that way of they one, the choosing to enjoy and access pleasure in maybe one in the face of that. And there are all arguments to be made about how this is in this state and all of that. And not in a disagree with all of those arguments, but I've been thinking a lot about the ways in which life and death are often in conversation with each other, but in the context of something that clearly there is so much of this kind of embrace of that or that returning that life that, you know we need to confront that in order to learn how to live um mm -hmm. and even Gary talks about this you know in his final interview Gary uh, was talking about how you need to learn how to die and not to finally learn how to live. I mean, one has to know what it means to, to, to understand one's mortality, to confront one's mortality, and not to have an access to life on it in this sense. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm answering that question, but I, I've been thinking about this kind of something that Han said about what it means to return that to life, to, to, give, to give that back to life that I find fascinating. And, and it's just an interesting politician. It's not a new politician. It's not, I don't think it's particularly new, but I think mm. he articulated it with, was very um, simple and elemental, but it was very interesting. Um, yeah, I would have liked to see Han discuss a bit more about sexualization because in the movement of Beyond the Pleasure Principle, as many of you probably know, the, the, the logic of the uh, loop of sadism and masochism produces a desexualization. And Eros, in a way, is kind of, or the erotic even, it's kind of pitted as a different modality of subjectivity or affect of subjectivity than, than sexual, sexual differences, right? And so Han does develop a theory of the erotic, which I think we should consider when we meet again, because it may actually make us more um, at ease with his wider project. Because I think that a theory of eroticism as a new form of a social bond, right? As a new way of thinking a bond 
of exhausted subjectivity, right? Is strong and necessary. Um, but still, I, yeah, I would like to see a little bit more of a, because these are not easy concepts and, you know, he's not really, uh, I don't know, grappling with the, the sources as much as I'd like uh, in a certain way. Um, Cause I'm pulling up, I'm pulling up all of my notes from like Deleuze's essay on sadomasochism and Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle and like the 16 incredible commentators on that text. And he's citing like three people, right? Which is fine, but you know, maybe a little light. So, uh, he, you know, he says this is this is a you know, hard, hard so that compelling for me, and I, uh, this is actually such a, a a moving passage because I I just I was so captivated by it. But he says, you know. Every political revolution must be preceded by a revolution of consciousness, one that is that that life. The revolution must create an awareness of the fact that life is only truly alive when there is an exchange with that. It must demonstrate that the rejection of that destroys all living presence. A lot of is that it's a form of a preoccupation with the past and the future, and the present ends, the ends of life is lost. I thought that, that was actually, I, I don't know, I'm, I, I thought that there was something so powerful in there around, yeah. you know, about political action, even, that even, you know, a choice to go out and protest in the middle of a pandemic is. Is, is, a, is a reflection of that, you know? I'm choosing to be out in the midst of a pandemic because my life depends upon it, or our lives depend upon it. And I think there's something about that that I think is so, you know, so important for us to think about, that mm -hmm. think about political organizing or, or um, um some notion of the revolution or whatnot yeah i don't know what others think but i like this point he makes that the maxim of political revolution today faces a deadlock because the injunction that we suffer from is quote protect me from what i am right so this is kind of um and you see this in a later chapter on cutting on the subjects, the youth subjects that wound themselves. So there's a certain like um, lack of an initiatory sacrificial collective potential, which he's right to point out, no doubt. I don't follow the pessimism of the such a strong argument that we're all subordinated to this neoliberal order. I mean. It's the same thing that I had the problem with um, Adam Curtis's latest film. It's like, they don't make any acknowledgement of sources of negation of the order that we live in that are there. I mean, like, you know, like uprisings and strikes and riots and, and, and actions, like these things are real. Does anybody else kind of take the side of Han that actually neoliberalism is a very bleak and totalizing system for which no revolution is possible. It's gonna be hard for you to now that I downplayed it. But, no, but does anybody have a thought on this point? I feel it problematic because then in chapter three, just at the end, he says, when talking about surveillance, digital surveillance, he says, it's time to organize a collective resistance to the looming digital, digital, digital totalitarianism. Uh -huh. So I don't know what he's saying. He just claimed that revolution is impossible. And now he's claimed that we should organize a collective yeah, 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 yeah. resistance. No, 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 no. Maybe, 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 maybe he's saying that the old language of revolution is dated. Okay. Maybe. So it's a sort of aesthetic gesture, maybe. 
it's an aesthetic gesture to a new vocabulary of revolution, a new. So I think I think that's fair. I, I, maybe he's not so strong. A certain way that he writes can come across extremely mm. strong, though. Or maybe maybe in the second chapter he's claiming like Shishek, the revolution is impossible. That's why we should do revolution. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't think he's saying that, but maybe we should yeah. find it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So um, we throw ourselves enthusiastically into our work until we burn out. The enthusiasm is, in fact, the first stage of burnout. Burnout and revolution are mutually exclusive. It is therefore wrong to believe that the multitude will throw off the parasitic empire and establish a communist society. Um, and then he goes on to say that neoliberalism has, so he says that the kind of theoretical proposal of a kind of communist utopia, even though it's not a charitable reading of communist theory, is sort of already realized in a sharing economy and in, in the gig economy and in blah, 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 you know, Silicon Valley and all that shit. Okay. Um, Communism as a commodity, that spells the end of any revolution. So, yes, I mean, this is self-evident, right? I mean, although, what do you think though? Because it is true that Hart and Negri 10 years ago were writing about the potential of the entrepreneurial subject to accelerate beyond certain certain forms of neoliberal capitalism, right? So that, like they can be critiqued on that basis, no doubt. Um, and then of course he gets into all of this business on um, the total exploitation of the human being, which I found um, quite nice. I mean, I think the nice thing about that section is what? Apropos the pandemic, he makes a beautiful point, which is um, one proof of the discipline of the achievement subject is that we have, by and large, even though there's a kind of, I don't know, somewhat fringe anti-vax movement and so on, maybe not fringe, but if you look at that historically, even his whole point about the census from the 1980s, that was a very nice point I found, which was that like people resisted this capture of the state militantly in huge numbers, even as something simple as the census, right? And now he is correct that we have a type of really insane compulsion with it. So, uh, yeah, this is no doubt. Um, um, I just read a beautiful essay, by the way, by somebody who's written that kind of, um, that total critique of Khan and all of his theory that's gonna be published in his new book by Ben Cook called On Libidinal Economies. I don't know if I can share it yet, but it's quite good. Um, kind of puts Han into conversation with a bunch of other theorists and looks at his work in totality. It's quite good. Um, so yeah. Um, how are we doing on time? We've gone for about an hour and a half. I want to respect everyone's time and also make sure that we touch all of the questions I think we've gotten maybe through our goal, which was the first three, four chapters we commented on most everything. Um, but I know that some of my friends have been quiet. I know Levi is still with us or has he left? John is here. Morgan, what are your thoughts at this point? No, I I like the text so far. I was probably the most interested in, um, I guess, since we're talking about libidinal, libidinal economy, I was really interested in the first chapter where he started talking about um, necrophilia 
Um, so that's my that's my comment in relation to capitalism. Yeah, yeah, that first chapter is the richest for sure. John, do you have any? Uh... Yeah, I I just wanted to uh, something that has been especially as it relates to the ethics of death that Ricky was touching on. Yeah. Um, I've been really focused on seminar 17 from Lacan for the past couple of weeks and thinking mm -hmm. through, it, trying to work through it. And Lacan ends that seminar and there's this amazing essay by Joan Kopchak, the, the 68, the emotional month. I believe we read it for one of our groups, maybe, yeah. but how he ends his essay on like dying of shame as like the primary affect with which he wants to like call up our Lacan apparently claim, I mean, I, I have the seminar in front of me, but I haven't read the whole thing yet, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like dying of shame is an affect that is, I have it. Meanwhile, to die of shame is the only fat affect of death that deserves, deserves what? Deserves it. So essentially like, I, I, th I wonder, I wonder how, ha so a couple of questions that have been percolating in my head is I've, I've been also reading Peter Starr, uh, The Logics of Failed Revolt. Sorry to yeah. do this hodgepodge shotgun of all no, these no, 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 no. But I also positioning Han within, is he the fool or the knave? Like I'm, I'm wondering if like mm -hmm. be too reductive to the Lacanian discourse, but like, mm -hmm. and not to return everything to him, but nevertheless, like is, is, is Han operating as, as fool or, you know, as a knave, as a rogue, you know, and, you know, I don't, mm -hmm. I wonder, where the two intersect and if he is doing that. But anyway, I was concerned primarily in this haphazard comment in what affect one is to have from reading this. If one is to, to take an ethics of death of this, is it to return to that notion of shame in the master's discourse where you're dying for something, right? You're dying for like- a, Yeah. I was yeah. reading Larry today, like like Mishima, right? Like he died for yeah. something, and yeah. I'm wondering, like, if is Han calling for that return to like sort of this master's discourse, or is no. he? And, and no, obviously, yeah. I, so I, but I don't I wonder, think so. That's a great point. Yeah, because for those of you that know Seminar 17, you'll know Lacan makes that point, which is as an analyst, he has a unique place speaking to the students and the rebels of '68 which is that he shows them their shame and they have a crisis over a lack of shame, in fact, right? So there's a certain argument of the society of the diminishment of otherness as producing a crisis of shame because when you had a society of a kind of, I don't know, stable is the right word, but you have a kind of um, proper dispensation of one's own sovereign singularity, right? The proper dispensation of the S1, right? Of the master signifier, right? It has a kind of uh, flow and so on. When that collapses, um, Lacan took it upon himself to uh, argue that, uh, yeah, like a, a, a slave would die for shame, right? There is a, there is a, a possibility of a true um, a successful, service or sacrifice or something like that so no i don't think that han is following that kind of lacanian lashing that's why i think that yeah like there is a certain freudian lacanian traditionalism i don't want to say conservatism that i think han is not a part of as to whether he's the fool or the knave You'll have to help me and remind me what that distinction is, but that's an interesting uh, one by Peter, by, by Peter Starr, is it? Well, it, Lacan himself mentions this, like the, and Zizek writes about it in uh, Plague of Fantasies, the, like the two political dis dispensations, and it, it is very reductive, but there's the fool and the knave. And the, the fool is the one that has the truths that just comes from his mouth, but it nevertheless, ah. It, yeah. And that's the leftist dispensation. Whereas yeah. Nave finds Jewish sons or pleasure or enjoyment right. necessarily in the other person's reduction. And through Han, I'm noticing this, like he is, he's sort of like finding a lot of, in, seems to, I don't know. I mean, I don't know him personally, obviously, but I'm saying there seems to be a lot of enjoyment in the impossibility and that we're all screwed and big data has moved on. And 
I, I, and uh, for that reason, I'm not not enjoying the text, but I'm not, I'm, I'm also like, well, I, well, I should just read seminar 17 is what I keep saying to myself. Like I like the, not to be a jerk, but like, I wonder oh. like, I, because all of this feels like, or like, like the Fisherian, like the Fisher sort of capitalist realism stuff that like, mm -hmm. It, it, it to to touch it what you've been uh provocating like it feels somewhat reductive to the the very real struggles that are happening all around us like yeah, yeah. and to Lu lewis's point earlier like revolution is impossible but that's why we have to do it like and I, it seems as if it is operating on a plane of knavery if 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 that makes sense like this sort yeah. of like enjoyment in the impossibility like everyone can take a shot at heart and agree. Like, I mean, everyone, <laughs> and it just feels like it doesn't, I, what does that do? You know what I mean? Like, yes, yeah. there is a certain foolish naivete there, but I also don't see the, I don't, and he's making wonderful arguments about archaic societies and death and find, fighting off against death. And I never thought about Freud's death drive in terms of warding off death, but nevertheless, I think that, if I am to be provocative, there is a sort of neighbory to a lot of this. And I don't, mm. and I, and I, and it, it, I prefer the position as Star mentions in the Logics of Fail Revote of the Lacanian tragic comic, you know, like, yeah. and I, this feels more like, it doesn't feel tragic comic at all. It feels like kind of like, yeah, as, as Amanda was saying in chat, it's kind of like depressing and bleak and like, and I'm yeah. not trying to say like, let's, let's all be, you know, perform <laughs> wonderful but well there's something there's something also yes it's bleak and so on and maybe pessimistic and so on but it's but it's is it in also isn't it also decisive like like i said this inverted universalism like there's also something liberatory about facing up to the total capture like we're all fucked like there's a certain summoning is summoning us to accept this condition right as the means of a new solidarity so I do sense that too, right? So there's something subversive there that maybe that's useful. You know, it is, I feel I feel that um, I feel that I'm at the heart of neoliberalism. I think there's a resistance to the beliefness in in kind of mainstream discourse. You know, everyone knows that they're part, but no one. No one wants to, you know, no one wants to kind of acknowledge that. And I think there's some, some kind of power in acknowledging that. I think that's what you're talking about. There's a kind of solicitousness to acknowledging the uniqueness and using that as a starting point for something else. Because I don't think that that's actually happening. I think there is, you know, I think that about climate change, constant, and, and just like constantly thinking about climate change and that how, and yet people are still having children. You know, it's this reproductive impulse that keeps, you know, that people tend to organize themselves around, which is all very well like and good, but there's something about that the resistance to the beliefness of what's out there, you know, that climate change, that you can't actually seem to confront. And I think that's what Han is trying to do, is that Han is trying to... I mean, I don't, I, like I said, I don't always agree with everything that he says, but there is something about putting a mirror up to our face and saying that stuff is, stuff is bad. <laughs> Um, there's not a lot of people are actually saying that, at least not in a way that um, calls the question the kinds of choices that we have to make when it comes to politics. Um, that's a really interesting, that's, that's a really good way to put it. I mean, there is something about this text that is not melancholic. And that I think is saving to, to me. Because I mean, otherwise, I think I would agree with John. Uh, uh, I mean, I generally I really appreciated his 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 thoughts here. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it does. And and Ricky's um, introduction to that that um, 
passage about, hold on, I'm pulling it back up. You know, that the uh, uh, what we need is another form of life, one that rescinds the division between life and death and reconnects the two. Um, you know, the, a, a reintroduction of death. Um, that strikes me as in some ways kind of in line with this idea of a, of a resistant sort of bleakness, you know, I mean, we have to start again. Um, that is the most preposterous premise of, you know, of, of things like today's climate report. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I'm a, you know, a student of modernism and in general, I, I'm really interested in this, you know, this is a kind of quest narrative for a lot of modernists, you know, that, Maybe there's a crisis of tonality. I mean, I'm a musicologist too, so you know. Maybe there's a crisis of tonality. Maybe there isn't. But for the modernist, there's totally a crisis of tonality, and like tonality is dying, and tonality is dead, and I am dead tonality, and now I'm something else. Um, you know, so that that process of rebirth that is definitely a kind of wish for for a lot of aesthetic modernists. You know, that that seems to be at work here. It's not a I mean, to compare this, for instance, with something else, like Jonathan Franzen's take on climate change, you know, which is just like, he's just an asshole, you know? He's like, there's not really anything we can do. We have to accept this. We have to stop being idiots and thinking that we have to, ha we have to stop having so much hubris, <laughs> says Jonathan Franzen, about the idea that we can change things. Whereas I don't see this as a castigation of, of hubris. Right. Um, so that's, that is a really, that is a, I, I guess, a really interesting point. It's a, it's a visionary, it's a visionary take too. So, but that was the other thing that I wanted to actually bring up because there's a lot of appeals in, in what's being said here, including the idea that it's a visionary take. We're showing us a mirror, holding a mirror up to ourselves, right? This is an, uh, 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 there, this is a, there is a deep commitment to the imaginary, in an interesting way, you mm -hmm. know. Um, uh, in other words, he. There's a there's an integrity to this account that is you know totally unavailable in any seminar of Lacan's, where you know I mean there's a there's a uh, intensity and a kind of pursuit in Lacan seminars, but like you know you you're going through it and you're like Jesus Christ where am I now and now I'm you know it's turbulence in a plane, um, whereas here there is a smoothness to the account. So I guess I wonder how this might relate to things like you know, the symbolic in relation to the imaginary. Because at least in analysis, right, um, part of the work of the analyst is to reintroduce the symbolic as a kind of experience of death back into this, you know, endlessly revivifying kind of imaginary of, you know, the, the analyzant's fantasies, right? In other words, that's what the punctuation, that's what scanning is. Um, you know, that's what these moments of introducing impasse into, into, into the discourse of an analyzant who's all too fluent in complaining and in, in, in narrating their own difficulties. Um, so I guess I wonder, I don't know, this is, it's very abstract and, and maybe a real flight of fancy away from the, the text, but there's something about the smoothness of this text and the smoothness of the vision in this text so far and the way in which the visionary quality of the text thrives in a kind of imaginary sort of plenitude that seems at odds with the kind of death that gets us out of these sorts of impasses. Does that make any sense? Hmm. Yeah. And if this- I love, I love it. It's a true riff. Okay, it's well- great. I... It's great, yeah. 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 Other others, I jump in. I I kind of want to bring in. I think this this is a really interesting fault line. I keep thinking of like the homology with Deleuzian metaphysics too, and as regards like the death drive and the pure and empty form of time, like the third third mode of time. I think there's something really scary in this question of the co-optation of the present into just this hyper presentism. Kind of this like flipping on its head of um every single present um it's almost like what he was talking about in the first chapter of sacrifice is just like compressed like this the, this blood of the living present is just compacted into the what was this like libertary idea of like the pure and empty form of time like the the aeonic just 
eternal instant. And so it's like, it's kind of this terrifying, almost like ontological realization. Like, is this even sustainable to think in that sort of framework anymore, I guess. And that's kind of your thing, Ricky, too, with you had the line, like pleasure in the face of death. I thought of like the Bataille essay, joy in the face of death too. Like, is that, is a more kind of ecstatic Bataille ethics around death possible or is it worth bringing in like a different sort of juncture, you know, with Lacan and, and others? I just think the, there's a, there's a homology with, with Deleuze underlying a lot of this stuff that to, like scares me. And I, I think about it a lot of just the way that capital not only has it um, made, you know, a thousand plateaus into its like, like operating principle, but it is also, it also operates on a day-to-day -day level, just like Deleuze lays out in Difference and Repetition. And it's kind of the same thing with, with Leotard in the bar and, uh, and Klosowski in Living, in the Living Coin, like, the 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 principle of death is just so completely imminent. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm super interested in this this juncture of like uh, that sort of like Deleuzean framework with something that's um, I don't know maybe precisely not that and um, more Lacanian, which I'm like way less familiar with. So. So everybody had to wait till the end to make all of these brilliant little interventions. Uh, it's incredible. Um, well, I, you know, I, I want to say that is, is that is something that Seth said, and then this is why it's all coming out at the end. And it's something about the smoothness of this text that I found somewhat disarming. That it's 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 a, it's. It's also, it's so also moving and compelling, and it's so, it's all there. It's almost like he has all the answers, and that I, 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 I find I'm suspicious of it, and I'm, I'm concerned about it. Because, and that's precisely because, as as Seth mentioned, it also, it's not a matter of how it acts by any stretch of it. Imagination. It really is like confront that what we have lost, and this kind of goes back to something I was talking about around how this harm, at least for me, how this harm confront the question of loss, um, and what we have lost in capitalism. Um, and then this is why lots of things are coming out at the end. There's, there's something about the, the smoothness of the text that sort of renders you kind of silent. <laughs> it is it kind of rendered me silent when I was reading it. Yeah, I think it's, uh, if you use the metaphor of the, um, the event of, of the kind of neoliberal achievement society is, is an absolute event for Han and that's very, and the consequences of that are all transparent, you know, in a way that kind of, kind of mirrors the same transparency of the system which oppresses us. Um, so yeah, that's all very, uh, it's a, it's a great sort of I don't know theoretical device that he's that he's giving us. Um, I really like how the arc of our conversation has ended in finding this kind of kernel of something um, less pessimistic and more resolute, more emancipatory in this text. Now this will um, compel us to continue to work with it. Um, I think for next time, we'll meet again on Monday night in one week and look at, I think, three or four chapters, like five, six, seven, maybe eight as well. Um, and yeah, so if anyone else would like, let me just say one thing. If anyone would like to 
uh, or be willing to um, lead part of the discussion of the text, let me know. Or maybe I'll, I'll like uh, track you down and force you to uh, or convince you, uh, persuade you to. Uh, but does anyone else have thoughts? I'm thinking of like um, Nathan or or Robin or or um, uh, early is early right? Yeah. Love your I, love your thoughts. We have like five more minutes, so happy to hear what you think. I don't um, have much to say because um, I'm definitely out of my league here uh, in a certain way. Um, but I've really enjoyed hearing everyone's thoughts and it feels very um, evocative and thinking about um, death. And I was just thinking about the last, the last line in the, um, the introductory remarks is uh, one might argue that a viral contagion of the likes that we are experiencing presently makes this all the more important to consider. And I just thought about um, likes as in social media likes and um and anti-vaxxers and sort of like the exchange of death and what han was talking about until we're able to um incorporate um, death into life in some way and the anti-vaxxer movement in some way is even though a lot of them are in massive denial are courting death in a way that um that other people maybe on the left are being so careful about avoiding death and um and uh something about even just but also the anti-vaxxer movement is also extremely profitable and um there's a lot of um, money and grifting happening off of um uh, getting likes from uh, conspiracy theories and um, and so there's a um, yeah I don't know it's just kind of an incomplete thought that I had but yeah I mean Hans ambiguous about the um, modalities of kind of everyday resistance to the pandemic in the sense that he's clearly maybe even ambivalent about it in the sense that he makes the reference multiple times to the prior social order of power where people were much more willing for different reasons to resist the state. Um, and now we have this kind of inner compunction, inner super egoic principle, which is fundamentally different than that. But he's obviously not going to entertain some kind of the same kind of celebration of, say, what Agamben would find emancipatory about some of those movements. So he's, he's not willing to go that far. Um, but you're right, there is something paradoxically, um, uh, a certain form of potency that you could say certain forms of uh, anti-pandemic activity possesses. It's very hard to sort of locate that, I feel. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a very interesting point, though. Yeah, maybe just related to that, like, I guess um, I found it a bit maybe surprising. Like, this is like a minor point that like, um, like it seems like the kind of moment of resistance that does seem to come up in the text is like this, this like anti-census protest. Yeah. Um, and it's like a motif that comes up a couple of times. Um, and I guess, um, like I wasn't sort of clear on like, like the political character of that movement. Uh, and I was like thinking about it in the context of um, anti-mask, anti-vax, you know, type movements today. And, uh, you know, obviously I think it's something, you know, quite different than that. Like, I mean, it, it, it did, doesn't seem like it was sort of a, like overtly like reactionary movement or anything right. um but i guess um yeah I, I was wondering like um in terms of like like sort of locating like resistance to like uh big data and surveillance and whatnot like 
like does he kind of fall into this sort of danger of like um i don't know if it's is it a kind of uh, fetishizing of like this um sort of uh like this anti-census kind of uh, movement or or like uh I, I suppose like like is it still sort of based in an idea of like like the individual subject who kind of um you know possesses like one's own sort of data in a sense and I, I don't know I was just curious like um I guess um like you know given that it, like it seems like in some ways like the west has sort of um responded in like the most individualistic way to the pandemic like whether he would entertain like a um like a different mode of response in which like the state would play a larger role or whether because it seems like it falls into kind of like a or, or there's a risk of like a James Scott type thing, like like a sort an almost a bit of like a state phobia in that yeah. sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the chapter "The End of Liberalism," he invokes the distinction between the Asian countries and the liberal Western countries, and you'll you'll see there that he addresses this point pretty head on, kind of leaving leaving many many provocations out there. Um, that are quite compelling, I think, um, because I think his his argument is ultimately that in the grand scheme of things, in the liberal uh, Western social orders, the 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 subjectivities of resistance to the pandemic that we that get a lot of airtime in the Western media are kind of in a, will will be and are ineffectual ultimately, so they're not really worth diagnosing because they don't constitute um, a true threat to anything. Like in that sense, I think he would argue that um, like as an ideological formation, are they really, um, not only are they, a, they're, they're not effective, but like how would you even understand them in a certain sense? Like it's a completely, I don't know, it's in that way that he's also dismissive though at the same time of left-wing movements, right? Of like Black Lives Matter or, or, or Occupy Wall Street or something like this, right? Or left populism, right? He's, he doesn't really have uh, the patience or the kind of interest in identifying those attempts as efficacious, right? I think he has a completely different theory of politics. He's much more aesthetic um, in his theory of, of, of politics. So I, yeah, I don't know if that's he, helpful. He actually wrote about that in an article. I think it was just for a Spanish newspaper and explaining all of that. And it was interesting because in that article, he criticized Shishek because, you know, he wrote the pandemic series, you know, Shishek claiming that uh, because of the pandemic, which there should be a, you know, a new international movement. So, so. And, and Hannah was uh, saying that actually capitalism will get stronger, right? And I think that, I don't know, I think that he's right, right? There was no international movement and capitalism might get stronger. Uh, we might copy, as he was arguing, the Chinese model of surveillance, right? Right, right. Knowing of, of what right. is happening with the pandemic. That's what he argues, that's, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's, this is very foreign to my politics, but I'm willing to, uh, if I've spent so much time with Nietzsche, I can spend time with this. I'll put it that way. Um, look, this has been great. Um, I think we should close and see each other in like a week from now. And do, do send me a note if you'd like to like, just lead part of the discussion. I would really love the, the help. And uh, this was really great. Really appreciate everyone's time and insights. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. Much. Peace.